This is the Art Beauty Podcast, where we tell the real truth about the fake shit. I'm Amber Mills, and today, my fabulous and brilliant co-host is Dr. Drew Taylor. He is a co-founder, or the, yeah, the co-founder of Acorn Biolabs. This is a company that is delving into cell preservation for um, anti-aging, for longevity. We're going to get all into that, but I want to welcome you so much to the show. Thanks for being here, Dr. Drew Taylor. Very excited to be here. Thank you so much. Can I call you Drew? Absolutely. Okay, we're going to keep it casual friendly here. Um, so, So, Drew... You know, on this podcast, we have talked about things like biohacking. We've talked about ways that nutrition can help us, you know, regenerate and keep ourselves, I'm not regenerate, optimal, keep ourselves working at their optimal peak performance. Um, but but you're taking this sort of one step further by actually talking about cell preservation cryogenically, correct? Correct. Yeah, I mean, I think the best principle really to kind of think about it is, you know, we do things constantly as, as people that are, are enthusiastic about longevity and, and biohacking to try to optimize our bodies and, and enhance performance. Um, but what if we were able to take some of ourselves and freeze it in time when right. it was like easy to optimally perform and then leverage that as we age? I am so excited to get into this because I love the science behind this. I love seeing how technology has changed, um, not only in the beauty space, but in the health and wellness space. Um, so, you know, before we dive into this, you have a very, very impressive background. And I think it'd be nice for people to hear sort of how you came to co-found uh, Acorn Biolabs. Okay. Well, I'll have to go back a, a little bit. I um, I ended up actually going uh, to the University of Michigan uh, to do my my first leg of education. I did my undergraduate and, and master's there in molecular cell developmental biology. And I also played for the Wolverines uh, on their yeah. baseball team, had a, a really great experience. We won a Big Ten championship and I uh, was one of the co-captains last year, the last year there and was set to head off and, and go to medical school in Michigan. Um, and I ended up getting an offer from the Toronto Blue Jays to go play professionally. So it was pretty exciting for me. I come from a bit of a baseball background. My dad played professionally as well. And, and so I ended up deciding to, to accept it. Uh, I deferred medical school. I, I petitioned to see if they'd let me do it simultaneously, but they, they told me no way. Um, but they actually did say, if you want, you can do a PhD. That's a little bit more flexible of a program from like a, a course basis. So, um, so I actually enlisted at the university of Toronto in uh, biomedical engineering and did my PhD while I, I joined the, uh, the minor leagues in, in the blue Jay system. Okay. So my husband, um, he was a pitcher for Georgetown. So, and, and his whole family is a baseball family. So I know a lot about baseball. I've had a few friends who played in the minor leagues. I don't think people understand how competitive it is to be a baseball player. Um, I mean, so when you say you were a baseball player for the minor leagues, you're like one of the very, very best in the world. That's just the reality of it. It's a highly competitive it was definitely competitive, um, for sure. I I was really grateful to have the opportunity to to play at that level. Um, and look, I, I worked super hard to try to make that last jump and and uh, end up in the MLB. Um, I unfortunately had an arm injury, um, yeah. which was a bit of a blessing in disguise because it it really pushed me into my career today. And and I I, I love what I do, and I think it's making an impact. So it is it's a real honor to be part of it. Um, but absolutely, you know, it is a competitive environment, uh, pretty cutthroat. And, um, you know, it was, it was probably good training for a lot of the things that uh, you do later in life and in business and with family and, and all of those, those different areas. You know, we're going to get off the baseball thing in a second, but my husband once told me one of the best, um, pieces of, well, I don't know, advice, information that stuck with me, um, uh, that he told me that baseball for as a whole, it really teaches you how to fail because even the very best, the very best ball players have like a, what is it like a point three point oh, a, yeah. a 300, whatever it is. You see, you can tell, I, I kind of yeah. know baseball, but, yep. but basically what that means is that every two out of three times you're at bat, you're actually missing. Well, even higher than that, usually, you know, even the best baseball players fail seven out of 10 times, seven out of 10 times. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's like a 30% game. So, wow, that is really, really impressive. Um, I'm, I'm blown away that while you were playing because um, baseball has so many games, it's not like the NFL where you've got, you know, 12, 18, 16 weeks. God, I'm not a sports person. Sorry for everybody who's cringy out there. Um, 
but but baseball there's like hundreds of games in a season correct Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, 162 games in the regular season um and then you get into playoffs and that extends it further you know as a comparison the nba is probably the next longest and it's less than half that so it is it's a very long season with a lot of games so So, how was it that you were going to school during this time uh, I was, I was the, uh, I, I wouldn't, I shouldn't say I was the odd man out. We, we played with some brilliant players, but not many of them were working on a degree at the same time. Right. So I think that I was definitely the guy in the bus that had the pressure to have a book open and be studying. Um, there were some, some moments that were difficult. So I think I kind of just fell into it and didn't really know any different, but uh, I can remember one time we were playing in, um, in the Chicago area and I ended up, um, flying home, um, immediately after our game. And uh, and being in Toronto to write an exam at uh, 9 a.m. in the morning, then went straight to the airport, got on a flight and actually started the game that night at seven o'clock in uh, in uh, Chicago. So it was it was definitely a bit of a, you know, a jaunt sometimes to try to get it all to, to line up and, and work well. But um it seems to have. Seems okay. literally paid <laughs> off and we're going to get there in a second. So um, after, after you graduated from the University of Toronto, you did some work with Mount Sinai, correct? Yeah. So most of my work um, while I was at University of Toronto and in, in my PhD program was at, at Mount Sinai Hospital. And I ended up working with that group afterwards as well. And it was a, a really fantastic experience. And it, it introduced me and I'm always grateful for baseball, literally just for making me push towards that PhD because uh, developing some of these next generation therapies is, is just an unbelievable honor. Um, when I joined that group, my role was actually to look at some animal studies that had gone very well and translate those into human models. So jump from the animal cells to human cells. And so I got my clinical fix. I was going into the OR and I was taking biopsies of patient cells when they were coming in for arthroplastic surgery. So fake knees, fake hips. Okay. And um, obviously all of these people have cartilage damage, um, you know, and that was my specialty is trying to recreate them cartilage so that they would be able to, instead of having metals and plastics put into their bodies that, you know, will break down over time and and not be a, a lifelong solution. Can we give them something that will last the rest of their lifetimes, has the ability to heal, have the same response to shear forces and stresses as the rest of our body, which is a massive, you know, indication of longevity of any treatment that we can do for your cartilage. So um, it was me coming back with these cells from the OR and seeing if we could replicate the animal studies and regrow cartilage on demand for people. Uh, And it didn't go perfectly Um, to save everybody a lot of really boring reading. um, It boiled down to age, right? And all of the animal studies that we had run previously, the age of the animals were teenagers, basically adolescent animals. And now I'm going in at the time of need of these patients, usually elderly, already have damage to their cartilage, sometimes compounded with osteoarthritis and disease. And then I'm, I'm asking those cells to perform at their best again in culture. And it didn't work very well. When we did have access to younger human samples, um, the younger, the better, right? But you saw an increase as the age went down across that study. And conversely, in animals, we went back to that and actually got access to some older animal cells. And the exact opposite happened with them. Those those cells did not perform. So age was literally the massive limiting factor on our ability as we move forward with this project to be able to deliver patient care. That's okay. happening everywhere. Like, yeah. you know, all of the other amazing groups around the world developing, you know, heart therapies and and the ability to, to regrow uh, organs one day, right? All of these things uh, are going to be dependent on the quality of the cells that we have. So, I mean, I don't want to sort of, you know, digress too much, but I, I, I remember for a while I was hearing about people who were taking um, umbilical cord cells to, pr- to preserve, from, you know, when you were having your child mm-hmm. um, that you could, pre- was it umbilical cord yep. cells? Yep. Yeah. Um, to preserve uh, you know, it, it, it almost sounds a little bit like the stuff of science fiction. You know, we go back to like Disney freezing his head and, and that <laughs> whole concept. Um, but, but can you tell us, you know, we, we've come so far in science and I think that we're all pretty much open to like the possibility that, Hey, anything is possible now. What are some of the things that cell preservation can do when it comes to anti-aging and when it comes to, you know, beauty specifically? Mm-hmm, absolutely. So f- first, I would say 
I just want to make sure that because uh, we don't always get the ability to access some of the information that's going on in, in some of these universities and, and groups around the world. But it it definitively is not science fiction anymore. Um, we are doing some unbelievable things like a group in Tel Aviv has re- 3D printed a miniature human heart that has the ability to beat, can hold blood and, and has vascularization. It's about the size of a rabbit's heart, but it's completely built with human cells. Wow. And there's no question in our lifetimes, we're going to see the first 3D lab grown heart implanted into a patient to save their life. Um, we have uh, 12 patients in North Carolina walking around with 3D pl- printed bladders. So you start in areas where you're not you know, saving a, a, a life necessarily, but you're a, giving a patient back their ability to control urination, which is a massive quality of life increase. And it's a fairly simple organ. So ultimately those were, were some of the first targets and, and that's been successful a dozen times in a trial. So we are at the, the precipice of seeing this absolutely explode. And I think that in this kind of recent years, we've learned a lot about what's important for us to be able to deliver value to patients and actually have success in those areas. And one of the big things that was going up in Toronto in in my neck of the woods is treating burn victims with their own skin cells. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was designed specifically literally to to focus on younger people that had felt these things because we knew that obviously those cells are going to perform very well in culture, but nobody under the age of 40 was included in that study. Right. right by design um and so i think that we need to think about look you know all of these things are becoming accessible what we're at risk of is that you know millions of people that are around right now are going to miss access to it right. because unfortunately at their time of need their cells will have advanced uh, in age and are not going to be a viable resource for us to use okay i mean before we get into all of like what acorn labs is doing we keep talking about age. I'm in my 40s. Is it just like, am I shit out of luck? Is it too late for me? Can I turned 40. Vote? I turned 40 last week, and it was a big moment for me. I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, if everybody goes through that, but all of a sudden, seeing that four was was a big deal. I think that um, we have to think about age in a multitude of different ways, and absolutely, just to like clear the air, 40 is young in my mind when we talk okay. about these things. Okay. All right. Um, I think that if you want to think about an age where there's a little bit more sense of urgency, it's doing this before 65. Oh, and okay. That, yeah. And that is because, um, you know, the younger you do this, the better. Let me be right. perfectly clear. Okay. Right. We peak in our 20s and it's all downhill. Right. Um, and you see the changes in our cellular health and you can identify them at 25, right? It's already happening. So at 65, though, um, that acceleration of age related changes picks up pace. Right. And so um, we do really try to see that being said, we've got patients that have come to us in their eighties and have banked their cells because their mindset, God bless them. They want to live to a hundred. And so ultimately they want, they know that their 80 year old cells are going to be better than their 90 year old cells. Um, So it is, it is age is just a number. Absolutely. But ultimately, you know, the earlier you can do this, the better. And for those people that are listening, that are are creeping up into their, you know, into their sixties, I think uh, they should try to act pretty quick because changes start happening faster. Wow. I mean, so, you know, how much of this too is dependent on your bio, you know, your chronological age can be one thing, but your biological age can be another. We all know, you know, 40, 50 somethings who look, uh, you know, 50, 60, and we all know 40, 50 somethings who look like, you know, in their 30s. Mm hmm. Look, I mean, genetics plays a huge role in this and we all age differently. Um, and some people do better maintenance than others, right? So, it, and, and that pays off as, as we get older. Um, but ultimately, I think that we have to think about also different cell types in our bodies aging differently, right? Some people absolutely lose collagen faster than others. And so you'll, they'll end up getting wrinkles younger than others, right? And so there are, you know, very specific things that contribute to what we see in a person and how we evaluate their age. But um, you know, these, these things kind of hit all of us, right? Regardless of whether you are blessed genetically or not, right. they will catch up to you. We all get wrinkles. We all get older. We all, you know, wear out our cartilage and our skin gets thinner and, and all of those things. So we, uh, we all need to be thinking about this regardless of when it hits us. And that 65 age that I referenced is the average. So some people are going to start that process earlier. And some of those people we're referencing that look fantastic in their seventies, they're probably starting that process later. Right. Now, you know, oh gosh, I, I hate to seem um, so vain because you were actually talking about self-preservation for things that can be life-saving, 
hearts or or really um quality of life changing new new knees new new bladders uh but but i i know that acorn does have a you know sort of beauty side to it um a which huge one honest, yeah. let's be honest like that that is a quality of life thing that we want to keep to how we look on inside or how we look on the outside can affect how we feel on the inside and vice versa um so let's talk about some of the things that sort of why you created Acorn Labs and sort of what it is specifically set out to do. Absolutely. So Acorn is trying to prepare people for the ability to take advantage and receive benefit from regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is simply using our own cells to benefit and replace the aging process as well as disease that we're going to face in our lifetime. Um, A big component of that is our skin. It's the largest organ in the body. Um, It is our face to the outside world and the barrier to protect us and everything inside. So not just from a beauty perspective, but actually from an overall health perspective, our skin is infinitely important. It is also really interesting uh, because for us, we see some of the abilities to leverage these cells coming fastest in our connective tissues, specifically our skin and also in sports medicine, right? So for obviously joints, um, tendons, ligaments, those uh, cartilage. And so I ended up working in cartilage, which is a type of connective tissue and has a lot of correlates and similarities to the skin. And we were able to translate a ton of of that work because I now focus more of my time looking at skin than anything else. And um, and it's exciting, right? The, The leaps forward that we're experiencing that we're already seeing patients benefit from is happening in skin. And so it is really the frontier of where we're we're seeing patients that are benefiting from having their own cells. So like, like, tell me more about that. What are some of the things that you're seeing? What are some of the things that are being done with our own cells um, Mm -hmm. in relation to, you know, skin? Yeah. So I, I want to be clear for everybody listening. These things are coming. They're coming very quickly. And the people that are getting access to them are usually in a clinical trial that is testing their efficacy. Or super rich. Well, that that too, right? <laughs> we all have read the articles that come up online, right? And you see, you know, Kim Kardashian is doing something with PRP and, and we see whatever, you know, you know, Stephen Curry has received a stem cell treatment, right? Um, these things are are happening. They're just, you know, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Right. So um, absolutely, you know, red carpet celebrities and high-end athletes are already getting access to some of these cutting edge things. Um, that being said, though, I think that we all... Um, are going to be getting uh, a lot better access to them as this, this, these next, and I'm not talking, you know, years away, but I think that some of these changes to the industry are coming in months. Wow. So can, can you clue us into as to like what some of these like things are? Yeah, absolutely. So we think about um, the benefit people are going to have from their cells is three buckets, short-term, medium-term, and long-term. Uh, the long-term is what we've talked about mostly which is literally like regrowing tissues on demand for patients to treat disease. Um, And we do a lot of that. We work with some of the top institutions in in North America, and we've got uh, a lot of grant funded research projects that literally are taking hair follicles, which is our target cell source that, that we focus on and turn them into pancreas cells and kidney cells. Absolutely. Uh, you know, before I don't want to cut you off, but that was the other thing I was going to ask you because I happen to know that the hair follicle is what you collect. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking, look, hey, I mean, hair loss is something that we've covered on this podcast and, and is something that so many men and women deal with. And it can be just absolutely debilitating. So hair regrowth aside, you're telling us that we could take a hair cells from a hair follicle and use them for other organs. Yes. So right now, what the the state of those long-term projects is, is taking your hair follicle, um, putting it into culture, so creating more of them, expanding them, and then turning them into the cell type that we are going to want to use for a targeted therapy. And the one I referenced that we have done in our lab um, is creating pancreas progenitor cells on demand for patients. And so the implications long-term would be, are we able to recreate you, not even necessarily a a whole new pancreas, but just the islet beta cells that are required for insulin production and target things like diabetes. What about things like pancreatic cancer? I mean, that is something that is so... So Yeah. So pancreatic cancer is a really interesting question. We're getting way off skin, but um, (laughs) it is really interesting. Um, So pancreatic cancer, um, you know, we can't cut out the pancreas. Right. Right. So this, you know, this, this is some of the like, you know, things that 
are the issue. Um, but if you catch pancreatic cancer early enough and it is localized in the pancreas, what if we could grow you another one? And by taking out your pancreas and putting a new one back in, you're eliminating that cancer. You're not even having to treat that cancer necessarily. You're just getting rid of it and replacing the part that, that got exposed. Sorry, my grandmother passed from pancreatic cancer. So I, it, it kind of hit me, but wow, this is really, really incredible. And like you said, you know, maybe things that aren't available today, but that you are as an expert seeing in the near future. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so going back to skin, sorry for everybody who, who's listening to me, if I, if I got too off track, um, what are some of the things that we're seeing in terms of skin, in addition to, like you mentioned before, regrowing burn patients? Yeah. Skin, so, so that would be like treating a disease or a trauma. Um, but, uh, a lot of the work is actually done in the aesthetic world. Okay. Right. And so, um, we are looking at the components you know, in our skin that degrade over time. So every year that goes by, our skin cells produce 1% less collagen. That's why we end up getting less rigid skin. We've ended up seeing wrinkles, right? We get collapse of and thinning of the skin. Um, hyaluronic acid production drops significantly. And the, the, some of those numbers are even more scary. Hyaluronic acid production by our, our cells um, between 25 and 55 has already dropped to about half. Wow. So you, you end up having these very steep, you know, curves that are happening and, and obviously the effects of aging shows. Um, what we do at ACORN is, is we bank your cells. We take them from the hair follicle, which is the highest concentration of adult stem cells in our skin. Um, these, these are mesenchymal stem cells and, uh, you know, maybe some people have heard mesenchymal stem cells before, but it is one of the primary targets that we think about a lot of these stem cell therapies that people are talking about and, and they're going through testing. And so the hair follicle is now a source that you can actually extract mesenchymal stem cells from a patient for. And so we've turned those into cartilage, bone, fat in our lab, and really shown the diversity of these cells and their ability to help patients and obviously skin. And so with, with these cells, um, you can expand them readily. You can create more of them on demand. They cryogenically freeze very efficiently and strongly. So you end up being able to create a reservoir from your, of your own cells to really tuck away and hold on to for the future. Wow. Um, and will people be, you know, like we said, so what are some of the aesthetic, um, yeah. what are some of the aesthetic procedures that you feel like are going to be happening one day? So not even one day, but I think um, it's going to be happening, if not tomorrow, the next day kind of idea. Like this is this is already um, well beyond the stages of development. Um, most people have probably heard of PRP. So PRP is called platelet-rich plasma, and it's essentially taking a, a draw of blood, spinning it down in a centrifuge, and separating out the red blood cells from the plasma. The plasma is what we are after. We throw away the red blood cells. And this plasma now is concentrated and rich in platelets, but also growth factors, right? The things that are going to stimulate our cells to do all the things that they're not getting as good at doing. Um, and we use this pervasively in aesthetic medicine, in uh, sports medicine, even in dental work, where you can create this, this concentrated growth factor formula, right? And deliver it to a site of injury or need or where you want to incite some cosmetic benefit. Um, and it has really um, amazing results for some patients, but it is very variable. And that's because it's dependent on you right? You're taking your own blood. So depending on your health, the quality of the growth factors and the quantity of those growth factors that you do have naturally at that time, that's what you're concentrating and giving back to yourself. So there is variability. And that's one of the biggest kind of things about PRP that I think is, um, you know, leading to different patient experiences with it. Uh, when we were looking at orthopedics, like young athletes were, were having amazing results from it. And unfortunately, as we, you know, tried to leverage some of those same techniques in the elderly, the response was not, not clear. Um, and so I think that for, for us, thinking about how we can standardize that by leveraging our own bank cells is one of the first ways that we're going to see benefit delivered in this space. And so your cells that you've banked can become a factory for yourself. They were locked in time at a certain age, and you keep on getting older, those, those cells that you banked don't. You can pull those, you know, out and actually create um, treatments for your skin by asking those cells and culture to create things like collagen, hyaluronic acid, and all of those growth factors that continue to decline in production as we age and give them back to ourselves. And so one of the first um, ways that these cells will be, be 
used is essentially to create a PRP like product that we then give to patients for all of the same things like the vampire facelift, the regrowth of hair, right? Reju skin rejuvenation, all of the areas that PRP is being used today, except much higher quality and much more standardized quality from your own cells. And so we see levels in our lab of between two and 34 times higher volumes of all of those essential elements of our skin and hair produced in, in our method versus PRP itself. So is, is Acorn Biolabs, um, are, are you producing then these, you know, are, are you producing products that you then ship to people to use at home? Yeah. So those are, these are the two sides of Acorn, ah. right? So, so right now, um, what we do is we actually give patients the opportunity to lock in time, right? So right. actually take a sample of their cells. We work with a number of plastic surgeons, dermatologists, um, other medical practitioners, you know, that offer this in their clinics as a service. Well, they will actually do a, uh, a sample collection. It's simple, non-invasive, painless. I, I, you know, I've plucked eyebrows. So I would look like Eugene Levy. Um, I'd rather look like Dan Levy. So I, I pluck my eyebrows. I've all done it. It doesn't, it's not painful, right? Like we all have, have done these things before. And so by banking those and tucking them away, um, you've locked in that age. And so that's one side of ACORN is preparing you. And then the other side is really developing all of the use cases and how you're going to leverage those cells. Wow. Okay. Um, so, cause I was kind of wondering like, all right, so we're going to essentially go into a doctor. They're going to remove what a, a number of hair follicles. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is it plucking? Because I've seen, um, you know, a hair transplant therapy where they actually punch holes. So it's not punch therapy. It's just... No, it, it's plucking. So literally like oh. the, the most invasive instrument that is in our kit is a pair of, you know, ergonomic tweezers that everybody loves and gets to keep after it's done. So that's been pretty popular. And these tweezers uh, are used to just pluck hair follicles in the same way that you do plucking around your eyebrows or wherever else. And so it is very simple and painless. Um, we take 50 and we target from the back of the scalp from ear to ear. Now to put that in context, um, we've got between 100 and 130,000 hair follicles on our head alone. So this is, you know, nothing um, in, in the grand scheme of things, completely unnoticeable. Um, so we do get questions of like, oh, can I see where they were taken from? Absolutely not. Um, and the hairs grow back because you end up taking, right, the bulb of the follicle, but the portion of the follicle and is the outer root sheath stays and it regrows a follicle and a month later you'll have that hair back. Amazing. So it is, there's no, no loss. Um, on top of that, um, you know, this is something that is very, um, people that are losing their hair are hyper aware of right? Because they're used to talking about when you do take that plug, an FUE, right? And you take that follicular unit, um, it's gone, right? You're taking the entire thing and it is invasive. It does hurt. I've literally tested it on myself to go through that experience to see what it was like. Um, and, you know, we can take those cells, but plucking is what we focus on because it is so much less invasive. So at the time of, of somebody going in for a hair transplant, they can opt to have cells banked at that moment. And of course, you know, they're taking the FUEs and, and that's perfect. Um, but for most patients, especially think people worried about, you know, skin or, or, you know, sports injuries down the road and they're banking their cells for those reasons, um, plucking is, is what, what we do. So what happens if you don't have hair or if you have alopecia or, or. Yeah. So we have tons of, of patients and, and people and clients that have seen us that, that are struggling with hair loss. Most people don't have no hair, right? So there, there is a condition where literally every hair will drop out of your body. And, um, you know, there are options to do like plugs if somebody wants to do it a little bit more invasive, but that would be the option. Um, you have to have hair to grab in order to actually extract the follicle non-invasively. Okay. Um, so that being said, most people aren't completely bald. Um, and so there is usually lots of hair and we target that area because it is the last place that people ever go bald. Um, and there usually is lots of, of follicle stock in, in the back of the scalp there. Very interesting. You're correct. It normally starts in the top middle. Um, so, okay. So at what, what, so this procedure sounds pr relatively easy. Let's get down to the brass tacks. And we know that, you know, costs vary, uh, you know, 
country to country. I know you're in Canada, um, state to state here in the United States, they can vary. But but what are ballparks fees for this sort of a thing? Yeah, so you're going to pay, you know, uh, a collection fee to the clinic that you visit. Um, and that's going to basically include everything from uh, the time to sit down and have the collection, which is very quick, right? You can be in and out in 15 minutes, right? Um, and then uh, shipping of the sample to our core labs, processing of that sample, you know, in, in an ISO laboratory clean room environment, um, cryogenically storing those cells and creating a, a report back to let you know that everything was done correctly. We actually take um, uh, evaluation of those cells and look at membrane integrity and viability, and we report all of those back to you. So um, that collection fee will cover that, that first part, um, and you do that with your clinic. It's under a thousand dollars, you know, across the board, you know, prices will vary clinic to clinic, but um, you know, it is definitely uh, um, pretty accessible. And then uh, you end up um, signing up with Acorn and having an account with Acorn to keep those cells cryogenically preserved. And so those, those fees are actually extremely exciting and are less than you're paying for Netflix right now. So if you can afford stranger things, you can afford to keep your cells banked. Okay, what are we talking about? Can you give us a ballpark? 100, $190 for an individual. And then we have family plans for 350 that cover your entire household and kids. So those are very are, popular. Are people doing this with their kids? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, think about it, right? So I, I've, we've got three boys at home. And uh, if I came back to my wife uh, and I said, Jen, um, you know, I uh, had the opportunity to bank my cells today and I cryogenically preserve them and I'm prepared for the future but I didn't make that decision for my wife and kids as well. <laughs> I'd yeah. be on the couch. <laughs> so yeah. um, a lot of people like, you know, they hear about Acorn, they talk about it as a family and and we see a lot of people come in together as a group. I have a lot of stuff to discuss with my husband tonight. I'm telling you, you know, listen, I, I'm going to ask this just because I try to be the voice of the people. Um, all of this sounds so incredible. Um, what, one, you know, you mentioned you'd give a report, like, how do we know that it's like really working? How do we know that our cells aren't just kind of being shipped off or that we're not getting somebody else's cells or maybe yeah. I'm dumbing this down too much? No, no, for sure. And and we're a very transparent company, right? Yeah. Um, this is a company that was built by scientists, right? So our level of rigor from our laboratory all the way down to how we deal with clients and report back to clients is done with the utmost diligence. Um, and we, we take, you know, digital security um, as seriously as physical security of these cells. Like we are, are top to bottom built to serve patients. We want to be essentially a bank and, and then a therapeutic provider in the, in the future for you. And so those are two areas where you really need to make sure that the way you do things is, is bar none. Um, so we run a clean room facility that, you know, essentially is cleaner than an operating room. Um, so those cells are processed in an environment that is, is appropriate for our own cells and to make sure that they're, they're kept with care and there's no, you know, external impact or, or infections or anything. Uh, we analyze the cells using a microscope that, um, well, it's it's a pretty big piece of equipment, a uh, confocal microscope in our lab. It's definitely the most expensive piece of equipment in the lab. Um, and uh, it is allowed to, it is able to take pictures of the cells themselves and identify these markers for membrane integrity and viability. So it is, it is a very robust system that we go down. You know, our cells are stored between four locked doors. There's only a hand people of, uh, handful of people that have access to it. It's monitored 24 seven with every, um, every system has dual monitors that reports back to us. So it is top to bottom, in my opinion, um, you know, one of the best facilities in, uh, in North America. So question for you, um, is there any regulation on this type of thing now? Yeah, so there's regulation for sure around the therapeutic delivery of these cells. So, um, you know, FDA and Health Canada, they focus on um, things that are diagnostic, right? So we're diagnosing, we're telling you, you've got something definitively, um, or we're going to treat that thing definitively with a therapeutic. So people need to understand that all of the therapies are going to be, you know, going through FDA and Health Canada. For storage of the cells, there are bodies that um, evaluate that that is being done in the right way. And you can get those certifications, but they're very different from regulatory bodies like the FDA and Health Canada. And so we, um, you know, we've coordinated with Health Canada. They've even audited the facility that we we bank the cells in up here in Toronto. Um, and so everything is extremely transparent with what we're doing. But you know, it, that's not um, a diagnostic and it's not a therapy in itself. So it falls outside of Health Canada's um, focus, um, but 
we ourselves have um, taken on some of those levels of certification and diligence um, as a company to ensure that we're very transparent with the way we do things. Wow. And now you mentioned, um, you know, you mentioned that Acorn Biolabs has both the preservation and then you also have a sort of product development. Um, what are some of the products that, you know, if I send you my cells, you're going to be sending me back? So um, I think what is going to be coming in the very near future is what we talked about, that PRP opportunity, right? So it's not PRP, but it is a very similar um, product to PRP in the sense that it is going to be used to treat some of the same things. Um, and it's it's going to be able to be delivered in the same way, right, as an injectable. And so this is, or as a topical, right? PRP is used in both ways. And so this is essentially going to be like that, except have not only greater concentrations of the growth factors that we try to get in PRP, but it's also going to have the building blocks of your skin and hair itself, things that are not going to be in PRP, like collagen and proteoglycans and link protein and hyaluronic acid. We don't get those things in PRP, but we can get them from our cells. But, but you're not going to be, um, so will it be like a serum essentially? Because when you do PRP, yeah. generally you have to have some sort of a puncture. It's after a microneedling. Exactly. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So you can, you can do it topically after something that is going to open up pores in the skin, like microneedling, or you can inject it. Um, you know, people inject in the scalp for hair loss all the time. Right. But, but what are you going to be sending to people? Not oh, it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's going to be um, either a lyophilized or a freeze dried thing that you can suspend in serum or the serum itself. So you, 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 you know, oh, so like, that we would take to our doctor. It would go straight to your doctor. Got it. Okay. So, so you, you know, it would go to your um, dermatologist or aesthetic yeah. provider. You, you'd be going in for that therapy. We would prep it for you and it would be waiting for you at the doctor's office when you went in for it. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder, and the doctor, so, you know, the doctors probably like doing it themselves. That's a whole other thing. We're bringing in a better sort of a quality, but it's not like you're sending an at-home serum. No, no. Or moisturizer. Not, I mean, Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, I mean, obviously we're talking about the things that are coming, right? So there's, there's a whole host of opportunities. Like there are topical serums that can be created for the house. That's, that's, you know, we're, we're, I'm more talking about some of the things that we see coming in, in like, that are more therapeutic, not Got it. over the counter um, that, you know, ultimately are, are um, you could be going to your doctor to receive, right? Got it. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. I feel like we could talk about this forever. Um, you know, I know that this is kind of about to be coming to the United States by the time this airs, it might already be here. Um, where can people learn more about this if they want to do this? Absolutely. So, um, you know, would love for people to, you know, stateside to come uh, uh, check out Acorn at uh, acorn.me, which is our website. Um, you can check out some of the stuff that we're doing and get a glimpse into the lab and, and what we talk about at uh, Dr. Drew Taylor on Instagram or Acorn Biolabs on Instagram. Uh, we're pretty much on all, all the different social medias. I still have to get on TikTok, though. I'm not not quite there yet, but I, I got to talk to my kids, consult with them, make sure that I'm allowed first. Um, and then I think for um, for um, people also, they should know that there is an ability to sign up on our website to get notified of when it's going to be available in your area. Um, if you are in Canada, there are clinics that are on our website that you can uh, find, and we're in most major markets across Canada. Um, we still have a wait list in Canada if you want to sign up, if you happen to be somewhere that's very rural. Um, but uh, on top of that, um, you know, we already have locations that we've partnered with in the US. So before the end of the year, you'll be seeing it start to be offered at US locations. Um, yeah, so it's it's coming extremely quickly. Amazing. And you're just our neighbor to the north. So it's like, if I'm going to and I love Canada, by the way, if and we're I doing love the a US, trip I there, sp spent nine years doing, of my life living there. Uh, if we're doing a trip there, and you know, it, like you said, it's something to be scheduled in 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we, we've had a number of, of U S citizens that happened to be, um, we had one person that came specifically just to do it, um, uh, flew in and out the same day and, and got their cells banked. So, um, absolutely U S citizens have come up to a, to a location across the border. Um, you know, a bunch in Toronto, there's available in Vancouver. So some pretty close spots, um, where, where they can whip in, have it done and have fun in a Canadian city while they're there. It's such a great city. Um, so, Okay, what I you know I said we we're gonna like kind of wrap this up, but one last thing, will we've talked about you know you will create these sort of um, PRP 
plus serums, we're going to say, right, that, that have extra building blocks, as you mentioned in them, you know, if we need it therapeutically, what are some of the things like, you know, let's say you're in a hospital and you get badly burned. I guess you'll know about it later on, but how will the doctors know to contact you and will they be able to kind of access your cells for treatment? Yeah, absolutely. So I think as we get to the ability for all of those things, we want to build systems very much like, you know, donor networks, except you're getting access to your own cells um, so that essentially when those things do happen, all of the things get triggered to let us intercept and say to the physician, the patient does have their bank cells, they'll be able to see that on, you know, either their health record or from that patients uh, telling them themselves and link all of those things together so that the doctor has, you know, all of the resources and knows that this patient does have a resource tucked away for them if, if they want to go down that path. And I think that it's, it's going to be a, a you know, we're entering a, a very interesting future, right? Where, um, you know, there are going to be patients in, in, I believe that are going to end up having access to some of these next generation therapies because they chose to bank their cells. And then others are going to fall outside of candidacy because either the, an age passes and they're not, you know, appropriate for a donor and all of these different elements that cause with, you know, all sorts of complications. So um, I think it is going to be something that is pervasive. I think it's going to be something that is going to become, um, as as all of these things can continue to come to fruition, uh, standard of care, right? We'll be banking ourselves, you know, when we're teenagers or, or young adults, because you do want, you know, there's a difference between like developmental cells and, and our adult cells. Um, we're going to be doing this routine. Wow, this is so absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for spending time with us today, Dr. Drew Taylor. Um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, if you've got, you can go to his website, acorn.me for more information. Get on that wait list. I know I'm going to. Um, you can also, if you have questions you want me to pass along, I'm always happy to do so. You can write us at hello at rpdpodcast.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I see Twitter. We don't tweet. I'm lying. Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. I think I need to now bank some of my brain cells. I think they're frying way too fast. Um, but as always, we will see you next Tuesday. Bye now. <laughs>